So Cameron, the floor is yours. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Rick. Um, so yeah, as Rick mentioned, I'm from TechLogix. I am uh, one of the principals of the company. Uh, we do a lot of work with Cedia. So actually the deck that we're gonna be looking at today is a, is a truncated webinar deck. Um, we do the Cedia fiber optic training. We'll be doing that in San Diego in a couple of weeks. We do this in different parts of the country. It's, it's obviously hands-on workshop, two different parts. We go through the, uh, the why fiber and how fiber, why are we seeing it in AV? What are the different components? It's, it's a very agnostic presentation, but then we also get into the hands-on where we learn to terminate. It's difficult to do that in a, a forum that we have today. So what we'll be looking at is the why and the how, um, but also a lot of the technology that companies like TechLogix are out there developing and, and, and the technologies that you can work with uh, through your AllNet partnership. So without further ado, let's jump into it. This is the Fiber Optic Workshop deck. Let's start by talking about the term media over fiber optics. So this is really important. A lot of people talk about AV, a lot of people talk about things like HDMI and RS-232. It's all part of our lexicon being uh, AV professionals, right? I like the term media over fiber optics. In my mind, it encompasses everything we can use the fiber optic cabling for. And we'll talk about why fiber is important here in a minute. But the point is, there is more than just the traditional networking signals that can go over these fiber cabling. Today, we're using it for HDMI. We're using it for things like VGA, DVI, DisplayPort, but also control, RS-232, IR. Think of it this way. Anything we used the copper cabling for, so that twisted pair cable, that Cat5, Cat6 cable, we can use fiber for now with one exception sending power. Fiber does not transmit voltage. There's some benefits to that. We'll look at that here in a minute, but really all the signals that we're used to sending over copper, we can now send over fiber. The technology exists. And one of the best parts, the whole ecosystem, the way we design these AV systems, it's really quite similar, whether we're talking copper-based or fiber-based technology. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the different parts to a, a traditional system, right? We have bulk cable. Um, when people think of fiber optic cabling, very often they're thinking of that bulk cable that they're pulling through the wall or putting in the ground. And today what you'll find is a lot of homeowners are very familiar with the benefits of fiber. There's so much marketing of fiber to the home. It gives you more bandwidth. It gives you better speed, better reliability. A lot of our heavy lifting and the hard work that we have to do as AV professionals, it's done for us already. The problem is fiber hasn't found its way necessarily into the building yet. It's connecting all the buildings, it's connecting the homes, but it's not necessarily in the home. And it's really our job to start changing that. And there's some reasons why we have to change that. Now, the other thing we think about are patch cords or pre-mades, right? These are pre-terminated cables that are ready to get pulled not like a bulk. These are, you know, open up the bag or pull them off the spool. They're ready to go in. Specialty cable. So anything we're doing with copper, again, we're doing with fiber, direct burial, tactical, armored cables. It's all available. And of course, if you're working with cable, you got to be able to terminate it. You got to be able to put connectors on it. And most importantly, there's got to be electronics that work with the fiber optic infrastructure to move your signals from point A to point B. And if we go back two, three years, these just simply didn't exist. Electronics, they use fiber optic cabling is a very, very new thing to the industry. That's why we're starting to hear a lot of buzz about it. But let's start before we getting into, get into the different fiber parts. Let's start at looking at the why, okay? So this, uh, this little image here on the screen, I think this tells a pretty familiar story, right? If we go back 10, 15 years, we're all familiar with standard deaf television, right? And we've seen that this has evolved to 1080p. It's evolved into 4K. There's a lot of different variables in 4K, whether we're doing HDR or what's the refresh rate, right? All of this stuff can come together to affect what's known as the data rate or the bandwidth of the signal. 
Now, the interesting thing that most people overlook is CAT5 cable, CAT6 cable, that twisted pair cable we've been pulling for years, right? It's a network cable, but we've been using it for AV. That maxes out at 10 gig, okay? That's fine for 1080p. We can use it all day long for 1080p. But as we step into 4K, and let's face it, just about every single display we are buying today, we are putting in homes, those are 4K displays. Those displays require up to 18 gig in bandwidth or data rate. So now all of a sudden, even on the signals we're looking at today, 4K at 18 gig, you know, a Cat5 cable, a Cat6 cable that does 10 gig, we got a problem, okay? The bandwidth required for the signals we use today are already exceeding the max bandwidth of the cables that we've been pulling for years. Now, does that mean they don't work? No, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't work, right? We can get extenders. We can work with technology that will compress the signals. They'll take that 18 gig 4K HDR signal and compress it down to, you know, 9 gig or 8 gig, and it'll effectively transmit it through the cable. It works. It's not fully native uncompressed, right? There are artifacts. There are processing problems associated with compressing a signal, but it works. Well, we've got a new problem, 8K. Here comes 8K bandwidth. 8K goes up to 48 gig. The first iterations of HDMI 2.1 are up to 24 gig. So now all of a sudden, we've got this massive signal. The need to move these big signals over cables that have been installed for years, twisted pair cables, that only support up to 10 gig. That's not going to work very well. It's one thing to go from a three to one compression algorithm, you know, something like an 18 gig to get it down below 10 gig. It's a completely different conversation to go from 48 gig down to 10 gig. We're dealing with 20 to 30 to one compression algorithms, which means you're going to have a major problem with latency and video artifacts. And frankly, you're just not going to be able to do it effectively in these high-end homes that our customers are expecting to have this 8K video processing. And 8K is not like 4K. It's not like 3D. There is a lot of 8K content out there. For anybody who's a sports fan, right? We've, we've watched sports. We see how all of a sudden, you know, they'll be doing an instant replay. They freeze the screen and they zoom in on the goal line or they zoom in on the catcher's mitt, right? They're not doing that through zooming of the camera lens. They're doing that because they film those sports natively in 8K and they have the resolution to actually zoom in to the uh, the actual image, okay? There's a lot of content for 8K. Movies are filmed in 8K. TV shows are filmed in 8K. It's just the pipeline to get it to the home. But now that we're seeing fiber to the home, we're seeing more and more capabilities to get these signals natively from the point of transmission into the home. But more importantly, we're seeing HDMI 2.1 chips are now in production. So you will see 8K displays and you will see them fast. We saw them at, at Infocom a, a month or so back. We'll see them at CDN in a couple of weeks. 8K is real. It's coming fast. The punchline is you got to have a fiber optic infrastructure to really get your signals from point A to point B. And while we're talking a lot about 8K and HDMI and video quality, we really shouldn't overlook the networking side of the equation. This is equally as important, right? And we've seen fiber and networking and, you know, kind of enterprise deployments, um, you know, corporate AV type deployments and IT deployments for years. That's where fiber comes out of. But if we look at the projections for the average middle class home, we see that we've got an equal, uh, equally pressing issue here where bandwidth is only going to explode. You know, today, 2008, the average middle class home has about 23 different connected devices in the home. So these are things like your phones, your laptops, you know, appliances now are connected devices, thermostats, right? security systems. There's lots of connected devices that are finding the way into the average middle class home. And that's not even the customers that we're tending to sell a lot of this technology to. It explodes as we go out to, uh, 
two more years into the future, right? It's projected to exceed over 50 connected devices per average middle-class home, meaning we need to have a network infrastructure that will also handle this kind of bandwidth. This is where fiber is really coming into the, uh, the conversation. There are some other benefits. So I mentioned before that uh, one of the uh, perceived downfalls of fiber is we just don't transmit power. There is no power going back and forth. That can be a major benefit when we're talking about things like immunity to lightning. Fiber is immune to lightning. Fiber is immune to static electricity. It's immune to electromagnetic and RF interference. So these are the things, the problems that will knock out a lot of traditional twisted pair extenders. And, and the way I kind of re relay this to people in the real world, think of an HD based T extender, right? And TechLogix works with these. A lot of companies work with these. We've done it for, you know, decade plus. HD based T extenders will work great. But every now and then we have that problematic installation where we have our system up and running and for whatever reason a week after it's been up and running we lose signal on one of the displays okay we power cycle the extenders it comes back everything's working a couple of weeks later we lose signal on one of the displays you got a power cycle that extender 99 percent of the time that's because there's some sort of interference you know whether it's static or electromagnetic or rf that's disrupting the signals that are flowing back and forth between that transmitter and that receiver. Fiber is immune to that. Fiber also won't corrode over time. Okay? So it's a non-corrosive material, which makes it ideal for a lot of uh, environments and places where you guys are working and actually where we live. We're out of Madison, Wisconsin. That's where our, our, uh, our design center, our warehousing, and all of our development is here in Madison, Wisconsin. So temperature um, settings, outdoor installation. These are all really natural points of uh, deployment for fiber. Distances are another issue that fiber really comes into play. We can literally use these extenders in this cable to send high definition 4K HDR signals, 8K signals up to 20 kilometers. Now, are we going to do that in a typical installation? No, but do we connect gate cameras? Do we connect guest houses, garages? Yes, we do that. And we can send those signals very long distances. But most importantly, and this is a big part of the uh, hands-on workshop that we get into, fiber is easy to handle. It's very affordable. And frankly, anybody who can terminate a CAT6 cable, think of how long it takes you to terminate a shielded CAT6 cable. Guaranteed you can do a fiber termination in half that time more reliably and with a termination kit that's only going to cost you about 500 bucks. So the whole conversation around fiber optics has radically shifted in the last couple of years. It's a profitable sale. It's an easy sale. Um, there's a lot of benefits and simply put, anybody who's working with 8K, we're going to have to look at this technology. So it's a really good time to start talking about fiber optics. Now, before we look at uh, some of the electronics, let's talk about actual types of fiber cabling. So there's, there's different cables, constructions that we work with here. Um, simplex fiber, very rarely are you, gonna, are you gonna work with simplex. So simplex is one strand. You know, a lot of people call it one conductor. Fiber doesn't conduct signals. It's called a strand. So we have one strand of fiber that's connecting the two different nodes. It's going from point to point. Now, the reason I say you're very rarely going to pull simplex is because it just simply doesn't future-proof you. Duplex is really the minimum cable we want to be pulling. Duplex is two strands, and very often this is going to be a Siamese construction. The reason duplex is so important is because just about all the networking devices you use uses at least duplex. One strand's used for transmitting, one strand's used for receiving. That's where duplex comes in. Now, you can get into breakout fiber or micro distribution fiber. This is basically where we have multiple strands, you know, maybe four, six, eight, 12, 24. We make this in all kinds of different uh, varieties and constructions. But you got multiple strands of fibers all within one jacket. So this is what we're going to be using from, for connecting buildings, like that 
guest house to the central uh, main house or connecting different racks together or really future proofing. You know, as we talk about future proofing our, our cable runs, this is where having that distribution or breakout fiber really starts to come into play. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things, anyone who's pulled a bundled cable, you know that they can get really, really bulky, you know, heavy jacket, hard to pull, not very uh, um, pliable. Fiber doesn't work that way. It's incredibly durable. You'll see that in some uh, slides here as we go forward. The cable, um, the cable itself is actually more durable than most copper cables that we that we work with, and it, it kind of blows people in mind because you know fiber is a glass core. There's a core in the middle of the cable that is made out of glass. And people think, well, glass is really sensitive. You know, it can break, it can shatter, and then and then we lose our cable. And you know, truthfully, historic types of fiber that people have been working with, traditional fiber cables, they were very sensitive to being pulled. These cables could break. But the modern fiber cabling that we work with today, it's known as bend and sensitive fiber. I mean, you can literally tie this stuff in knots and it won't break, okay? It's incredibly durable, incredibly strong. We can handle it with our bare hands. Um, this is a great part of the uh, the hands-on training, what we do at Cedia, what we'll be doing with AllNet here in a couple of weeks, where you can actually work with this cable and see you know, a laser going through it. It's lit, it's lit up and we tie it in knots and pull it as hard as we can and the stuff doesn't break. Um, but there's other parts to the cable that we, we, we get into. There's what's known as strengthening fibers or aramid yarn. This is essentially Kevlar, most fiber. It's made out of Kevlar. It gives it a 200 or up to a 220 pound pull rating. So it's, you know, at least two, if not three or four times stronger than the copper cables. Um, and then we have other things like the cladding to protect it and the cable jacket. So it's a little bit different of a construction than we're used to with a copper cable, but you put it all together, it makes it incredibly strong, incredibly durable, much, much easier to work with um, than most of the cables we're, we're currently using in that traditional AV installation. Now, two other things we have to talk about here are the cable types. There's two main types of fiber that we'll run into, what's known as single mode fiber and multi-mode fiber. Um, basically, the difference in these is the core, the glass in the cable, the size of it. So single mode has a much smaller core. And that smaller core keeps those signals that the, the waves, the optical waves that are bouncing through it, it keeps it tighter together. And that allows us to go longer distances. So you see single mode fiber being used to connect buildings. This is what they pull outside of the home, right? When we're bringing fiber to the home, that's single mode cable. Multi-mode is a bigger core. You got more glass in it. It costs a little bit more for the cable, but the electronics are less. Um, so what we see is most people pull multi-mode fiber in the home, in the building. Uh, we typically say if you're going up to a thousand feet of a run, you go with multi-mode. You know, and, and you're buying your multi-mode in a riser or, or a, a plenum rated cable. There's there's different variations to it and all kinds of different varieties. But up to a thousand feet, we use multi-mode. Over a thousand feet, we use single mode. And here we can kind of see how that core, that core, that glass optical core inside the cable, um, we see how the light bounces through it. That single mode, it's a smaller core the light bounces much tighter together. We can go further distances. Where multi-mode, it's a bigger core. We can send more things through it, but it's really easy to get out of phase when we go longer distances. And if you get out of phase, your signals just don't propagate properly. That max distance is about 1,000 feet. All right, now let's look at the connectors. So there's five connectors that you'll see going on most fiber cabling. The good news is in the AV and the networking world that we all work with, there's really only two, LC connectors and SC connectors. These are the ones that you learn how to terminate. And frankly, they terminate you know, pretty identically. The difference is in the size of the connector. Um, the older installations had the SC 
C style connector, whereas most of the new installations, the new technology has the LC style connector. And the reason for that is really the size. So the size of the cable of an LC is smaller. And by being smaller, we can fit more connectors on the actual devices, whether it's a network switch or whether it's a, you know, a, a, an extender or an SFP module for networking, you can fit more LC connectors on it. And for that reason, we're seeing more manufacturers, TechLogix included, going to an LC style connector on the devices. Now, you will see some LC connectors out there. You know, people are, are going to buy both. You're going to do both in installations. And realistically, as much as I'd love to sell you connectors on every installation, most people are pulling fiber for future proofing. They're leaving it dark, which means they're not even putting connectors on it until they're ready to uh, plug it into some device. They're simply tying a knot in the end of that fiber and leaving it dark until they're ready to use it. Uh, but if you have to pick one or the other, if you're buying a pre-made or for whatever reason, or, or you need to connect it to terminate it to finish off the installation, odds are you're probably going to go to an LC style connector. Now, let's say you're going into an existing installation where you've got an ST or an MTRJ or an MPO connector, you're going to adapt it. The re reality is you, there are adapters for all these connectors. You can adapt those for an SC or an LC, which is what the devices today, the modern devices are really using, unless you're getting into pretty broadcast heavy installations. Now, let's switch the conversation a little bit into TechLogic's specifically, and this is part of that CEDIA training where we don't spend a lot of time on, especially when we're, we're doing a lot of these workshops. We, we try to keep it fully agnostic, but you will be seeing this technology from Allnet. Um, there's a lot of different parts that, that TechLogix gets into. So the thing about our company is we're really focused on all things fiber. And what we mean by that is everything from the cabling, whether we are doing basic pre-made cables, and pre-made cables are incredibly popular, or bulk fiber, or even custom fiber that we'll look at here in a minute. So as we walk through these different solutions, our goal as TechLogix is to turnkey that installation, everything from the cabling to the electronics, even things like AV over IP. Now, most people, when they are getting into fiber, they start with a pre-made cable. I mean, these are cut to length, pre-terminated. Um, you can get these in armored, you can get these into economy or in economy, I should say. But trust me, bulk fiber is not much of a stretch. You can learn how to terminate this. You can work with this effectively in about 10 minutes. The workshops are you know, really, really easy to get, uh, get your hands um, and head wrapped around the, uh, the different fiber cabling. One of the other things, though, that people see is actually the pre-made cables often can be less expensive than the bulk fiber, which keeps people going back to those for a lot of the theater installations um, and those kind of those standard length installations. If we compare the cables, this really kind of blows people's mind. Um, so fiber, for anybody who's seen it, I mean, really, really compact. I mean, this is a small pliable cable, right? The armored cable, so these pre-made where there's actually an armored jacket inside that's a stainless steel helical um, wrapped armoring. It's the same cable diameter as that bulk fiber that you're using without the armoring. So it, it's really... Uh, it's really surprising, you know, when you think of like an armored cable, usually they're pretty tough and hard to work with. It's not the case with fiber. So this is, this is one of the nice things about the workshop is where you can actually sit down and say, okay, look, here's the different grades of cable that I can work with, right? And these different grades have everything from, you know, 130 pound pull rating up to a 220 pound pull rating, the bend radius on these, you know, what's that all look like? And usually what we see is people settle on either the armored for longer distances or that bulk, um, what's known as an SSF grade fiber optic cable. Now, one of the other things you can get into this time of year, it's really, really popular is custom pre-made. So this is where you're doing that gate 
cam installation or you have that direct burial run. This is where you can design a fiber optic cable really based on any length, any construction, um, different types of connectors. You can customize your cable and, and, and really it's, it's shipped out all pre-manufactured on a spool for you. It even has the pull socket at the end so it's ready to get pulled into conduit or go directly into the ground. But this is an area where we've really carved out TechLogix as a business where we're not just helping you with things like bulk fiber or pre made but we're also helping you with all of these custom fiber lengths. So for integrators who are new to the fiber optic conversation, you can start turnkeying these installations for your customers literally right away. There's a lot of margin in it. It's really easy to start working with fiber. We're really dealing with only two different types of connectors. Again, worst case scenario, you can adapt those in the field for you know two, three bucks. It's not an expensive conversation, um, but you definitely want to start look at pulling these cables um, to future-proof those installations. But none of that matters if you don't have things to plug into the fiber. And this is where a lot of the TechLogix intellectual property resides. So we do everything from the DVI to the USB to the obviously the HDMI extenders. And the thing about our company is we do everything from 10 gig into 18 gig compressed and very uniquely 18 gig fully uncompressed HDMI transmission. So there are benefits to going both ways. Okay, there is a benefit to using a compressed extension technology. Even though you got a fiber optic cable that can support immense amounts of bandwidth, the networking connections and the networking technology that's connected to that cable doesn't always allow that kind of bandwidth. So when we do work like in Las Vegas, for example, you got to use a compressed solution because we're going through standard 10 gig patching hardware or switches or things like that. So we make the products that will compress that 18 gig down to run through the network, run through the uh, different equipment in line, and then come out at the other end. But what we see in a lot of the theaters is that you want fully uncompressed. This is where you've got that native 18 gig signal or soon to be that 48 gig 8K signal. You want it fully native, untouched, um, fully uncompressed compressed transmission. That's where really TechLogix gets into, uh, you know, into the technology. And if you look at these products, we've designed these to be very similar to those HD base T extenders you're used to working with. So when we look at this, you see things like HDMI, you see things like the control IR, RS-232, ARC, you know, the audio return channel. The only difference in these products is one, you got to power them on both ends. Fiber does not transmit power, remember, so you got to power these devices on both ends. But instead of a Cat5 connection, you got a fiber optic connection. Now, the last part of the technology that I want to talk about real quickly here is fiber optic based networking or AV over IP. So we make the boxes that will sit on the network just like, and there are a lot of companies that do this really well, right? Companies do AV over IP, like Just Add Power. Um, I mean, you can go through the list of companies that are AV over IP providers. Everybody's getting into it, but not everybody's getting into it with fiber-based systems. And the advantage of using fiber is now we can have a system that has zero frame rate latency, so real-time transmission. There are no legs, there are no delays between the different rooms, or if you're in a live environment, you have no latency. You have things like the ability to support 4K HDR natively, right? We can support high bandwidth signals. We can support things like video processing and digital signage processing. We can also, because we have so much bandwidth, tackle things like networking with the audio, with the video, with the control. So fiber just simply allows us to do more and have a more reliable, more robust, more future-proofed system in these high-performance homes, 
in these big installations and certainly in a lot of the commercial applications and the big installations that we get into. Fiber is simply a better mechanism for moving your signals from point A to point B. And TechLogix you'll find is really that all in, point to point, everything from the cabling to the infrastructure to the electronics partner that'll help you accomplish all that uh, transition from copper into the fiber optic world. So with that, are there any questions for me? Rick, you, you out there, you see any, uh, any questions? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, let me see. So the questions, um, it, is the, uh, the armored cable, is it, does it work like a, um, a shielded cable where the, uh, it could transfer energy or are these uh, connectors not shielded connectors? So in other words, there's no path for the energy to. Yeah, there, there is no path for the energy. The shield is okay. made to strengthen the cable. It's not like a copper, you know, oh. like an HD base T cable where the shield's used for grounding. You yeah. don't need that. And you also don't need immunity from static because fiber is non-conductive. The shield is purely to make it stronger. And, and think about that installation, right? Where we're doing a pre-wire and then they got to come in and throw the drywall up and, you know, finish off that, that installation, right? The, the actual um, building. Armoring is going to give you a protection from that. And I will tell you that in armored cables, pre-made cables start at like 30 bucks. So you don't pay a ton of money for that type of shielding. It's really, really affordable to have that protection. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, the other questions that are coming up are mostly related to us uh, in terms of like cost and uh, pricing on the AllNet site. Uh, Michael, we'll get that pricing up shortly. I'll make a note that you asked about it, and I'll see if I can uh, email it to you. Um, so John's question is, uh, can you compare a uh, thousand foot bulk of multi-mode to say um, like a thousand foot of high quality Cat6 in terms of price? Yeah, look at yeah. So what we tell everybody is you budget about thirty nine cents a foot. <laughs> That's the most popular duplex multi-mode that people are pulling. So it, it all depends. Here's here's what we find. If you're buying the cheapest Cat5, you know, 5E, fiber is going to be more expensive. If you're pulling like a Cat 6A, you know, made for uh, video distribution, very quickly that gets more than 39 cents, especially when you factor in the cost of the uh, the shielded connectors. So fiber, what we find for most integrators, it's pretty comparable. Here is one of the statistics, though, that's very, very important. And, and we have a little fiber pocket guide. It's not a product pitch. It talks about how to terminate and where to pull fiber and typical installations and things. But here's a big number that you'll take away from that fiber optic guide. Most people in the upper Midwest where, you know, I live and where you, I'm guessing a lot of you guys are working, they're buying their fiber at about 39 cents a foot the average price that they're selling it onto the projects at is a buck 50 a foot. So there's a lot of margin in this. And I wouldn't recommend that you sell it less than a buck 50 a foot because you don't need to. That's what people are getting for it. Yeah, that's a good point because every, you know, the Comcast tax and the, uh, you know, the, the guys that have the magnetic signs, they slap on the side of a white Ford Ranger. They're not out here doing this really like they are, you know, they'll come out and hook up a phone or hook up a cable box or whatever, but they're, they're probably not doing this very often. And if they are they're yeah. doing it for the utility, they're not doing it for individual homeowners. So this is a little fiber optic pocket guide. You can download it from the website. I know we got a bunch that have, have gone to all that. It, you know, it's a small little six by six. It's called a pocket guide because it'll fit in your pocket. But this is what I mean when I say that th this is a good resource. This will go over Wi fiber. It'll show you these different charts that show the bandwidth. You know, we looked at some of this in the training. It'll talk about the markup. Um, but this will also get into the different types of cables and your different options and why the bulk fiber gives you a better experience than, you know, a cat cable, for example, and the different bandwidths of the different types of fiber grades, because there are different fiber grades that you'll run into and you want to make sure you've got different bandwidths associated and even connecting. So there, there's a lot to this little pocket guide. It's a free download. 
you know, you can get a printed copy, you know, from all net, but you may want to uh, take a look at this. Okay. All right. We've got a couple more questions coming in here. So um, the next question that comes out or that, that uh, came in is in uh, underground burial for, uh, you mentioned runs to outbuildings, like to uh, mm -hmm. someone who's got a, uh, a garage that's out behind the property or maybe to a gatehouse or maybe to a guest house that's not attached. Um, what are the best practices for uh, putting this in the, in ground in the uh, in the conduits and then also uh, alongside other um, other cabling that may be going out there like the, like the uh, the electrical cabling or, or mm -hmm. other types of cabling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So there's best practices and then there's what we see in the real world, right? So I will tell you that we see more fiber that's going outdoors, going in conduit and just being pulled. And frankly, people are just pulling a standard plenum rated cable, you know, plenum rated fiber. It's about 47 cents per, uh, for a duplex, so two strands. And the reason they pull plenum is because the plenum's actually waterproof and there's no special jacket on it. It's, you know, it's, it's basically that aramid yarn that I mentioned that has waterproofing gel inside the cable. The cable's non-corrosive, won't fall apart, but that is what they're pulling. They're putting it in conduit. Now you can buy a direct burial cable. It's a, it's, it's an armored cable. The armor is really to keep somebody from breaking it or from cutting it. It's not necessarily because you need that protection from electricity like you get into with high voltage cables. Um, now, the next thing is fiber being totally non-conductive, I can't speak for everybody's codes, right? But I can tell you in certain parts of the country, people are pulling fiber right next to the electrical cable because it is fully non-conductive. And it is, according to the Bixie standards, a non-conductive cable that allows you to go into a lot of these installations where regular low voltage copper based cable just couldn't go. So long story short is if it's going outdoor, I recommend you look at uh, trenching in conduit. If you can't trench in conduit and pull a regular cable, you know, go with an outdoor rated jacketed cable or a direct burial cable. I know a lot of people just take the plenum cable and they bury it without anything special. I wouldn't necessarily do that because you don't have you know, protection from a dog digging it up or something like that. Um, and you certainly don't want to come back and trench it. Okay. That's, that's good information. Yeah. And I guess the, um, you know, we've always heard horror stories about, uh, you know, the vendor says that the cable can be put into, uh, put into a box next to a high voltage, uh, component. If the jacket is rated at X and if the distance is, are you know exceed a certain you know a certain distance but with this since there's zero voltage going through it whatsoever and it doesn't even it's not even conductive um yep yeah that hmm. yeah uh, it's it's a it's a different conversation than what we're used to using right when we pull cat five you know you talk about it's got to be more than a foot away from any high voltage not necessarily from a code standpoint but just from interference you know you you get sure. you get uh, a bunch of interference that'll disrupt those cables fiber's immune to that so you really just don't run into those same issues the one caveat to all of this is the armored cable that's got stainless steel in it so that's not sure. you're not going to want to put that directly into a high voltage environment it's still going to be immune from any interference and bleed over but you got that stainless steel housing you know, that is where you've got to be careful. But standard fiber, bulk fiber that we're selling, you know, most of the pre-made, the UV rated outdoor cables that we're getting into, tactical military grade cable. And by the way, a lot of people are putting military grade cable outside because it's really not that expensive. Um, none of that has, uh, has armoring in it. That stuff can really go where you need it to go. Okay. All right. So John has a question here. And... I'm going to let this, you're, this is definitely for you. What is the maximum bandwidth of multimode fiber? Yeah. So here, uh, there's a little chart for that. I will tell you that the problem you run into with bandwidth isn't the fiber itself. 
it's the electronics that get uh, that are that are getting plugged into it. So when we look at like the Bixi standards, Bixi kind of dictates cabling and networking and things like that. So they'll have their ratings. That's based on the electronics. Fiber by nature of being an optical engine, I mean, this has uh, what's known as 100 petagigs worth of data capability. So that fiber cable that you are pulling today, provided the electronics can catch up to the cable capability, we've got more bandwidth than we will probably ever see in our lifetimes. Okay. And that's we've seen that kind of on the on the commercial side where you know these big IT guys, they'll they'll leave the they'll leave the fiber and then they'll just replace all the electronics when it comes time to do an upgrade. So we used to see case studies about uh, how installing fiber was a was economically uh, advantageous because you didn't have to put like when you know we upgraded from cat three to cat five to cat five big e to cat six to whatever mm -hmm. whatever you had to replace cable every single time and it was very expensive for these large you know data centers and corporate environments but now with uh, with light we're just we're just passing light, we're signals through the light and all you have to do is replace the endpoints correct yeah. Yeah, and that's a big advantage, you know, and, and, and we obviously work with a lot of integrators and a lot of different folks out in the field doing this day in, day out. People are using a lot of active optical cables. It's important to not confuse an AOC cable. So this is basically like that long distance HDMI cable that's pre-terminated or has detachable connectors. That's not the same thing as a bulk fiber solution. Bulk fiber can truly be used for anything, whereas most active optical cables you're limited to the chipset the hdmi chipset in the product so you don't necessarily have an upgrade path whereas when you're pulling a pre-made bulk fiber or just or i'm sorry a pre-made fiber cable or true bulk fiber it is the different electronics that you throw on the end today we're talking about 4k hdr tomorrow we're talking about 8k you know two years three years from now we're talking about 12k and beyond that same cable can be used for it we, we carry those cables and the, when we present, you know, if anybody has questions about it, we always oh, state it like this, like when you're pulling, you know, in the, you know, the 10.2 gig era of HDMI, you could either pull a native HDMI cable or you could pull a CAT cable and use extenders. It's kind of the same mm -hmm. analogy. So the AOCs, it's a higher bandwidth, but it's still a native cable versus if you pull the fiber, then you've got the same you know the same thing that we had back then where, where if you pull a twisted pair you could re-terminate and put electronics on the end of it except like you were saying earlier we've come to the point where twisted pair is not enough anymore we have to have the glass now yep okay so um matt has a follow-up question uh have have inspectors in areas allowed um a non-conductive fiber to be pulled in the same conduit as line voltage for like an old retrofit people do it but i certainly i mean we see it in real world installations but i certainly can't speak to local zoning i, I mean okay. and I, I don't want to i don't want to be that guy that says yes and then you find out that you've got an inspector that comes in and, and says no i don't want to put you in that situation um you know all all the cables obviously have all the uh, the bixie codes the uh, ETL and the UL ratings and uh, all kind of the standard ratings on them, but it, it depends on your local your local codes. Okay, so Matt, reach out to your um, they call it the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction. Reach out, find your inspector, and uh, kind of take his temperature before you do anything crazy. Um, the worst case scenario is you know these are these are really uh, narrow cables, and like uh, Cameron was saying, they're very durable now, so you can. You can pull them. They're not delicate like they were, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Okay. Um, uh, Mike's comment is definitely not in Chicago. I would agree with that. Can't can't get away with anything. They err on the side of flagging everything always. Um, all right. Oh, here is another question from uh, Lamont who asks about uh, uh, what bundles to pull in different places. So CD and Bixi have had um, some things to say about um, about uh, what the minimum standards are for cabling. Uh, what are your thoughts on when it's time to uh, pull 
um, your coaxes and your twisted pair. And then do you do you recommend using fiber as supplemental still for uh, for the time being, or do you think fiber can replace those bundles? What's the, what do you think the timeline will be for when we can just pull just fiber and be done? Yeah, you know, realistically and honestly, I tell everybody it's still supplemental. Fiber is just starting to go out. As much as I'd love to tell you you're going to be connecting fiber to the extenders on every single installation, what we see, people are using it in the theaters because they want the bandwidth. People are pulling the fiber, but they're leaving it dark. They're leaving it for future proofing. And in this guide, we've got the, you know, kind of common applications, whether you're doing access control or general residential pre-wire, or you're doing that home theater. Um, my recommendation is usually pull one duplex fiber. Everywhere you're going to pull a cat cable, pull one duplex. It's really not that expensive, and most homeowners totally understand the value of future proofing. Okay. It doesn't add a lot to the project and it gives you all that future capability. It also gives you the ability to go back in and sell new equipment down the road. Um, but right now it's future proofing. You're still pulling that one cat cable to each location and you're still at least one cat cable to each location and you have that one run of coax. We are seeing less coax being pulled and now it's starting to turn to that one or two fiber strands or fiber cables I should say two or four strands for the total count and still that one to two cat five cat six lines okay all right and I think that I think that the um the one that Cedia recommended that they followed was the old um, TIA EIA 568 mm -hmm. spec, and that had uh, that had recommendation. It was a standard, but it was recommendations for uh, coax, for twisted pair, and for fiber. Um, so, if you're Lamont, if you're really interested in learning more about like what the what the standard is that's recommended by you know kind of like the the broad scope of the industry. Um, maybe look into that, the TIA, the EIA, the TIA 568 standard that CD also adopted and recommended. Uh, let me see. Uh, Mike is asking for micro duct solution to pull fiber later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we definitely see Smurf tube. Yeah, I mean, it's out for future proofing. It's great to uh, pull that corrugated blue tube. You know, we call it Smurf tube. You always have it for fishing in cables. Um, I, I'd love to see people always using, you know, the micro duct, duct the, the Smurf tube. But here's a good thing with fiber. And, and if you come to the workshop and you actually see it and start handling it, this stuff is really, really thin and really, really easy to pull and really, easy, uh, really durable. So if you do get into those installations where you're filling up your conduit or your Smurf tube, you can usually fish, fish this stuff through. All right, the uh, the next question it comes from Matt. He's like, is there a downside to running multi-strand versus duplex? It's a little bit bulkier. And there, there's a, it, it depends on the kind of the construction. So typically in outdoor environments, we're seeing somebody pulling a multi-strand, like in those UV rated outdoor cables or direct burial. Often that's going to be a multi-strand just because, you know, the jacket's already a little bit more durable, a little bit heavier duty. In the homes, we don't see as much multi-strand as we see people just pulling two duplex. It is so small and pliable, and it's a little bit easier to break it out. and You have a little bit more protection on those individual strands. I mean, usually people are just buying a thousand foot of duplex and, you know, pulling two runs. Okay. So another question that came up is we just found out that the um, the HDMI 2.1 standard they just released their um, their testing criteria. Um, when do we expect to see uh, chipsets for fiber extenders? based on the new 2.1 standard. 
Have you, do you have any yeah. insight? Yeah, we're waiting on it. You know, we're obviously not a semiconductor company. We use the semiconductors to build our, you know, our boards and design the products. We really realistically think it's going to be this fall. Um, you're seeing most of the display manufacturers and the media player companies getting the chips before us, um, which, you know, chicken and the egg, right? You need the stuff to connect things, but at the same time, you need sources and destinations to make it relevant. But we did see, we did start seeing 8K displays and 8K technology at Infocom. You're definitely going to be seeing it at Cedia. I think this fall, we're going to start getting the uh, chips. The nice thing is our designs allow you to take those, uh, the 4K chips out, the HDMI 2.0 chips, pop them out, pop in the 2.1, and we should be off to the races because our products already support the bandwidth for 8K. That's the nice thing. They're already engineered okay. for us. So you're saying that the, the extenders are field upgradable? They're not field upgradable because you got to actually pop a chip off the uh, the board and pop in a new chip. Oh, okay. Um, but our design, it's not like we got to go and rework a design. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. So are they, uh, is there an upgrade path at all? Or are you saying it's just an engineering from a product, from product A to product B that from yep. as a manufacturer, you're agile enough to get them out to market quickly because of your designs? Yeah, because of our designs, we're agile enough to get the products out to market quickly because okay. our because, because we're fully uncompressed, you know, there's not optical okay. engines that are limiting the signal. So it's it's really our our optical engines are going to support the that amount of bandwidth as as those HDMI 2.1 chips become available. Okay. All right. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to <laughs> create a fake news there. We're talking about yeah, uh, yeah, no, uh, no upgradability for, for existing product. Uh, Nancy's asking about cable TV. Um, mm -hmm. For cable TV, does this help? Most of these boxes, Nancy, still want the coax, but you can distribute after the cable box with this pretty easily. Are, do you see, um, you see cable TV companies uh, doing any fiber inside the home? No, we're not seeing cable TV companies doing fiber to the home. We're seeing a lot of fiber to the home, right? But yes. then they hit the DMARC point and then it converts to copper. I mean, realistically, when we're talking 8K, the way people are going to be getting 8K to the home is most likely going to be media players, where you're going to be downloading those signals, getting it into your media player, and then streaming it out from there. The the problem is, and a lot of people think, well, then why do I need fiber? I'm just going to put the media players at the TVs. Well, you don't always have the ability to have the media player at the TV, or you still want to distribute it throughout the home. And once you've downloaded your content, you've gotten that into the media player, you got to find a way to get it more than six feet. And that's where those fiber optic runs are going to allow you to do that. Okay. And I think another Another conversation there is, um, you know, we've had these media players for a long time, and the original Apple TV and the Kaleidoscape are the only two that I can think of that have the ability to set up uh, long, uh, long scale buffering to keep your mm -hmm. quality high. So the mm -hmm. Roku's and the all the later gen, the more recent gen Apple TVs, they do buffering, and if your if your pipe isn't, if your pipe's not full, then your quality goes down, and you know every even you know, um, basic homeowners who are just, you know, plugging these things in, they realize that because they realize that their, you know, their Wi-Fi is not very strong. So they, they run a cable and plug it straight into their, their router or their switch to keep their, their, their media players from buffering. And I think that's the same conversation we're having is uh, we're going to want um, the strongest possible pipe to that media player because it's probably not going to have a long buffer on it. So if we want it to be the highest possible quality, we have to feed it the highest quality, the highest, the best possible signal. Yep. That's where fiber comes into play. And that's why I tell everybody, you know, as much as I'd love to sell you a bunch of electronics today, you will use them in the theaters. You will start to uh, do fiber optic distribution, but you definitely, if nothing else, get the cable in the wall because you're, you're never going to regret having those pipes move these signals whether it's networking or AV okay so Alan's asking a follow-up question about multi-strand uh, about fanning out the uh, the individual strands and terminating so mm -hmm. you know we've obviously we've sold a lot of composite cables over the years that have had multiple cables in the same bundle yep. um, and sometimes it can be a pain in the butt to uh, to distribute it 
Um, what is the best practice? You just like, strip it way back and just fan them out before you terminate them? Depends on your, yeah, it depends on your cable. If it's a micro distribution cable, you're going to go into a breakout whip that is basically ah. going to strengthen that and break it out and we help people with that. If you have a distribution cable, those individual strands are a little bit bulkier. They've got a heavier jacket on them. Um, and then when we're all together for the termination training, you know, I kind of show everybody the different types of cables and the different types of fiber cables. Um, but yes, there is installation hardware that will break all of that out and, you know, make sense of it. And then there's distribution uh, trays where you can go into a little, uh, a tray and break it out to all the different devices in your rack or mount it on the wall and break it out from there. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, that's a good segue um, since we talked about the uh, the in-person sessions. Uh, and also, that's our last question that we've got here from Matt. He's asking about uh, one of the classes being offered on that. So if you haven't already seen an email about this, you should see one shortly, but I'll go ahead and give it to you right now. So we're doing sessions in three of our branches. So Elk Grove Village, Illinois, that'll be on Tuesday, August 28th. Uh, Troy, Michigan, where I'm sitting right now, that'll be Wednesday, August 29th. And then Carmel, Indiana, in Indianapolis Metro Market, that'll be on uh, August 30th. So uh, there are two sessions each day at each branch, nine to noon or one to four. And uh, obviously we serve lunch between, so you can either you know, uh, stay later if you're in the morning session or come in a little bit early and have uh, catered lunch with us. And Cameron's going to be here and he's going to be, uh, as he's been saying, he's going to have a hands-on session as well. So if you want to play with the fiber, if you want to terminate it, if you want to just learn more about all of the stuff that we discussed today on the brief one-hour webinar, we're going to have a more in-depth session with Cameron with uh, hands-on element as well. So, Cameron, what's the difference between the uh, the session that we're going to host toward, at the end of the month and what we reviewed today? I mean, aside from the uh, hands-on element. Yeah, we get into uh, from yeah, it is a hands-on, but we get into a lot more content. There are more things that go into the fiber, like different cable jackets, um, tight buffered types of cables. We go into a little bit more depth on the electronics. SFP modules, so we didn't really talk about how fibering plays with the network switches that you're buying and the access points, but that's pretty critical for most people because we're all putting networks into the home and just about every single network manufacturer brand now, regardless of what you're working with, you're seeing those SFP ports. So we really tie into that and uh, talk about how you can get into these full infrastructures and make sense of it. Perfect. Okay. So are we starting to see more switches where there's SFPs for multiple multiple ports? We, I mean, we've seen the stacking ports for years. Yep. Yeah, historically it's been all stacking ports, but now you are starting to see the, uh, the port for the individual point distribution. I mean, we do it in commercial world all the time. Um, you've got these big enterprise switches that are fiber based, but now you're starting to see companies that are doing the smaller ones for the home because we all recognize that AV over IP is starting to require fiber. Um, you can get access points that are fiber based. We're pushing more bandwidth in the home. And it goes back to that one slide that I showed you that, you know, network connected devices in the home are doubling over the next two years. So you got to have those infrastructures. Nice. Okay. Well, I, I'm excited for the I'm excited for the session, and you know, anytime it, I, lo I love it when the technology pushes forward like this, and we and we go from uh, these little evolutionary steps to a revolutionary step, and I think we're on the verge of it right now. It gives everybody something to sell in the future too. You know, today we're talking about upgrading the wiring path, getting the fiber in the in the wall. Two years ago, it was a harder conversation. It was a harder sell for the homeowner. Today, I think you'll find it's a very easy, profitable sale, but it also allows us to go back and then use the fiber for networking, use the fiber for AV, and really continue to work with those customers for you know future business opportunities. Okay. All right. If anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. We're, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I want to thank everyone for their time. And again, if you've got any uh, 
follow-up questions or if there's anything that you think of after we're done here, uh, shoot the um, shoot the feedback uh, back to me, to Rick Murphy. Um, many of you got a, a reminder email from Tim Sharvat. Tim's my colleague here in Michigan. So I, I blew up my I blew up my my main machine here at my desk. So I had to do it from Tim's machine. So I apologize about that. Uh, if you have anything, you're welcome to send it back to me. You're welcome to send it back to Tim. He'll, he'll just forward it to me. So um, also a little teaser here for those of you who are able to uh, to attend the sessions at the end of the at the end of the month, the live in-person sessions. We're going to have a nice promo, uh, pretty significant discount on the TechLogic's items like uh, fiber and things like that. So uh, reach out to whoever you're, reach out to your AllNet point of contact, your salesperson or your inside person at AllNet, and we'll be happy to talk to you about um, learning more about fiber and getting you registered for these events, whichever event makes the most sense for you for where you're located. So um, thank you everyone for your time today. Cameron, thank you as always. Uh, this is a great presentation. Every time I sit through it, um, I pick up a ton of new information. So um, thank you for your time, and uh, thanks for uh, agreeing to come out and visit us uh, at the end of the Yeah, month. my pleasure, everyone. Yeah. All right. We're going to go ahead and end the session now. So uh, thank you for attending, and we'll hopefully we'll see you next week as well. Thank you.